Welcome to IAS project. We are continuing with the videos on Indian economy for UPSC civil services exam. Let's look at what are the limitations of GDP. GDP does not capture externalities like pollution, damage to biodiversity, etc. For example, there is a factory here and this factory is manufacturing, let's say paper. Paper factory uses many chemicals and if this paper factory is simply disposing of its chemicals in a nearby river, then river may be polluted. The fish in the river may die. And whoever are the fishermen who are dependent on this river, they may lose or they may reduce their incomes. They may reduce their livelihood. GDP does not capture all these externalities. These are called as externalities. Externalities means that the paper factory and the fishermen or the river did not engage into any kind of arrangement to exchange this kind of phenomena in an economy. So the paper factory is simply causing adverse effects on fishermen. Such kinds of adverse effects are called as externalities. Externalities are adverse effects which are generally caused on economy, but they can also be caused on other people and other entities also. Examples of externalities include pollution, damage to biodiversity and others. GDP is a quantitative measurement. It does not measure qualitative aspects like inequality, happiness, human development, etc. We know that GDP finally gives us a number. For example, India is a 12 trillion dollar economy in terms of purchasing power parity. This does not tell whether people in India are poor or rich or what is the inequality, how rich are rich people, how poor are poor people, what are the education levels, what is the healthcare available to the Indians. It does not give any kind of information on qualitative aspects of economy. Also, GDP considers only marketed goods. Means, whatever is the work which is done for free or generally called as unpaid work, it is not counted in GDP. Let's understand this with an example. Let us consider there is a father. The father is teaching his children, let's say mathematics. And the children are not going to pay father. So, this kind of teaching or this kind of activity is not considered as economic activity. Therefore, it is not considered in GDP measurement. Let's consider another example. If the same children are going to a tuition and they are learning from a teacher and the teacher is taking let's say 1000 rupees per week. So this is called as an economic activity and this kind of economic activity is added in the GDP. The service that is delivered is being same in both cases. That is the father is teaching mathematics to children and the teacher is teaching mathematics to children. But when the teacher is teaching, he is taking the money for that kind of service. The father is not taking any money. Therefore, the service which is delivered by father is not called as an economic service and it is not considered in GDP. So most of the care economy which is done by housewives and do it yourself, for example, if you are installing a fan by yourself at home, it is not considered in GDP. However, if you are calling an electrician to install a fan, you will be paying that electrician Therefore, it will be considered in GDP. The next point is that most of the informal sector is outside the scope of GDP. For the informal sector, only estimations are considered. Also, transfer payments are not included in GDP. We have also seen what transfer payments are in our previous lectures. If you are not aware of what transfer payments are, please refer to previous videos whose link is given in the description. Transfer payments are simply those payments which do not expect a return. For example, if you are giving stipend to students in a college, you are not expecting any goods and services from the students. You are simply giving them stipend. So this is called as a transfer payment. Similarly, pension that is being given to old age people. Old people are not going to give back any goods or services to the government. But government is still giving pension to them. This is called as a transfer payment. GDP does not consider transfer payments because they are not given as an exchange to goods and services. Moreover, only final goods are considered in GDP calculation. For example, if you go to a car dealer and buy a new car, it will be counted in the GDP. But if you are going to buy a product from let's say OLX, it is not going to be considered as a measurement for GDP because the second hand car is not a final product. The car which was actually manufactured in the company and was sold by the dealer was the final product. And once it is sold, it does not become a product again for the second hand sale. However, if you are going to an agent, then that kind of service charge will be calculated in the GDP. 
but the value of the car itself or the value of the second hand car itself will not be counted towards GDP because it is not a final good. Also, certain items in GDP calculations are imputed. For example, all houses in the country are assumed to be rented because government has no time to come to every home and check whether this house is rented or whether that house is owned and being lived by the owners. So, government will assume that all houses are rented and it will calculate the rent value into the GDP. Now, let's see what NDP is. NDP is again a measure of production method, a measure of national income by using production method. NDP stands for net domestic product. Net domestic product is nothing but depreciation adjusted GDP. We already have GDP. If you remove depreciation from GDP, you will get NDP. We already know that depreciation is also called as consumption of fixed capital. So, GDP minus consumption of fixed capital or GDP minus depreciation mean the same thing. So, both are nothing but NDP. NDP is net domestic product. Let's understand what depreciation is. Depreciation is nothing but decrease in the fair value of an asset. And this decrease occurs over a specific period of time. Why does this occur? For example, you have a car. Once you start using the car, the tires on the car will be worn out. You need replacement of engine oil and the engine will be worn out. Similarly, plastic parts may be broken inside the car with usage of time and other parts may be damaged. So this is all nothing but depreciation. Once you buy any capital good, with the usage of that capital good, wear and tear will occur. And because of that wear and tear, its value will decrease. And after the decrease, the value is called as fair value. So over time, fair value of any capital asset will decrease. And that decrease in fair value is nothing but depreciation. Depreciation is calculated by the government itself. The government has the right to calculate depreciation in the country. So, depreciation in two countries may be different. For example, depreciation in India for a particular good and depreciation in USA or UK for a particular good may be different. Uh, when we include that fact that depreciation is different in different countries, although GDP may be same, NDP may be different for the countries. In India, Ministry of Commerce and Industry publishes depreciation rates for different kinds of assets. For example, on cars, it is 45%. So, Ministry of Commerce and Industry basically publishes depreciation rates for the entire country. Also, we must remember that depreciation calculation for an entire economy is very complex. Depreciation calculation is complex because the government has to consider the fact that what machines are being used by what kind of people. For example, same machine which is used in let's say a factory may be different from another factory. The usage or the maintenance is maybe less or more in different factories. So, government has to consider all those aspects. Also, government has to consider about what are the qualities of the different products available in the market. How about informal sector? Government may not be able to reach them and uh, know the kind of uh, usage of those items. So, depreciation calculation in an economy is very complex. So, because of this complexity, poor countries generally may not be able to calculate depreciation for all the assets. Only developed countries and bigger countries do this. So, NDP is not such a very wide measure compared to GDP because not all countries may calculate NDP but all countries calculate GDP for planning their financial development and economic development. Since depreciation calculation is not uniform across countries, technically comparing NDP of two or more countries is not very logical. However, NDP can be used to compare data across different years for a single country. For example, for India, you may plot NDP across various years. What is a NDP in 2019? 2020, 21, 22, 23, like this. You may plot a graph. This will give us information about economic development of India. But you cannot compare NDP of, let's say, India and Sri Lanka because the depreciation rates of Sri Lanka may be different compared to India. Also, we must remember depreciation when we mean there are two kinds of depreciation discussed in economy. One is depreciation of assets, which is nothing but consumption of fixed capital, which we just discussed. And there is also depreciation of currency. Let's see what depreciation of currency is. Currency depreciation is nothing but fall in the value of currency in terms of its exchange rate with other currencies. For example, with the recent situation which is happening in Pakistan, Pakistan rupee has been falling continuously. Similarly, Turkish lira. In 2019 also we know the situation of Venezuelan Bolivar. These all have suffered depreciation which means that, for example, in comparison of US dollars, 
all these currencies have decreased in value. So this is called as depreciation of currencies. Depreciation of currency may happen because of economic policies of the government. If the economic policies are not suitable, depreciation of currency may happen. Interest rate differentials also give rise to depreciation. Trade balance differentials also. Because if trade balance is not in our favor, what happens is foreign exchange reserves are going to decrease. If foreign exchange reserves are going to decrease, the government may not be able to stabilize the currency exchange rate in the market. So the currency may fall. Similarly, business cycle ups and downs may also affect currency. So if the business is doing poor in a country, then depreciation of currencies may happen. Also political instability. We see in countries like Yemen, Iraq, Syria, and Libya and all those countries, because of political instability, currency depreciation was very normal. Also, risk aversion among investors. What this means is, for example, if investors fear that a particular country's economy is going to go down, then they may remove all those foreign capital from the market. Because of this removal of foreign capital, what happens is forex reserves decrease and government may lose its ability to stabilize the exchange rate in its market. Therefore, currency depreciation is very common in such kind of situations also. An opposite of currency depreciation is currency appreciation. Currency appreciation simply means that the value of currency with respect to other currencies is increasing. Let's see this by example. US dollar equals to 75 Indian rupees. If after some time, one US dollar equal to 80 Indian rupees, this means that Indian rupee has depreciated with respect to US dollar. However, if after some time, 75 INR exchange rate has become 70 INR with respect to one dollar. So if one dollar has become 70 INR, this means that rupee has strengthened against US dollar. Or we can also call the such strengthening as appreciation of rupee. So weakening is nothing but depreciation of currency. Strengthening of a currency means appreciation of a currency. We have seen what currency depreciation is. Now let's see what currency devaluation means. Currency devaluation is nothing but a deliberate downward adjustment of currency's value. What this means is currency value of a country is reduced with respect to other currency but such reduction is not because of market forces but such reduction is because of intervening of central bank of the country for example in india if rbi directly intervenes in the market and reduces the value of rupee let's say against us dollar then such reduction is called as devaluation the difference between depreciation and devaluation is that Depreciation happens because of market forces. This is not done by government, but market forces do it. Devaluation is not because of market forces, but it is done by the government or central bank. So devaluation is a deliberate action. Depreciation is not a deliberate action. So why do countries do devaluation? Countries do devaluation because it reduces cost of countries exports and it can also reduce trade deficits. Let's understand this concept with an easy example. Let's say we have two countries, USA and India. India is selling shoes to USA. The person who is buying shoes in USA, he will go to shop or he will go to a market and he will buy shoes. He is going to buy shoes in terms of US dollars. For example, he is buying shoes made in India for 10 US dollars. 10 US dollars, let's say it means 750 rupees in India. So the seller in India is getting 750 rupees if the shoes are being sold at 10 US dollars. Let's say RBI has devalued Indian rupee. Previously, 1 USD was 75 rupees. So 10 USD is 750 rupees. The shoes were costing 750 rupees uh, for seller to sell and uh, the buyer was buying for 10 US dollars. Now, RBI has devalued the currency. Then, 1 USD has, let's say, become 80 INR. So, when the buyer buys same shoes for 10 US dollars, the seller in India or the exporter is going to get 800 rupees. So, the exporter is earning 50 rupees more than previous case. So, devaluation has helped exporters in this case. 
However, this kind of advantage is not in long term. This is only in short term. Certain countries do this kind of activity of reducing or devaluing their currencies so that their exports may be favored. Example is China. US accuses China that China is forcing its currency yuan, keeping it devalued so that it will be able to export goods and services to USA. So countries do this many times. So the difference between depreciation and devaluation is clear. Depreciation happens because of market forces, but devaluation happens because of government or central bank intervention. Devaluation is a deliberate action. Depreciation is not a deliberate action. So we have seen that depreciation of assets is different from depreciation of currency. Now let's see what are the advantages of depreciation. We know that depreciation is a loss of fair value. So does it really have any advantages? Yes, it has advantages because companies use depreciation to underwrite long term assets. What this means is, for example, if a company is purchasing a capital asset, what it is going to do is, it is going to reduce the capital assets value every year because of depreciation. For example, it is purchasing a car for 1 crore, then it is going to depreciate by 45% in first year. This means this 45 lakhs is actually considered as a loss to the company. Therefore, the incomes or the taxable incomes get reduced. As taxable income gets reduced, payable taxes also get reduced. As payable taxes get reduced, profit of the tax increases. Therefore, companies use depreciation concept to increase their profits also. Also, governments can also use depreciation as a positive economic tool. How? They can use it to boost sales of items. For example, government recently increased depreciation rates of commercial vehicles from 30% to 45% because government wanted to boost automobile sales, that is commercial vehicle sales. Let's follow up in the next video. Please like and share this video. Also, subscribe to IS Project. Thank you.